Hello guys, welcome to my channel. In today's video, I'm going to talk to you depths of space. Not long ago, people used to believe that the Earth was a flat plate. Understanding the borders of this plate was one of our biggest goals only a few centuries back. Oceans were filled with ships and their crews sailing away to explore the world. But today we are looking a bit farther. Towards the edges of the universe. In the last few centuries our search has led us to an incredible level. A level where we can observe even the deepest comers of the universe. But the steps that led us here actually started very early on. August 15, 309 BC. It was something that one might only see once in a lifetime. The moon got between the sun and the earth. The moon's shadow shortly fell on the islands of Samos. We call that an eclipse. Those who witnessed the incident had no idea as to what it was. They were probably looking at the sky in awe and confusion. But this incident would totally shape the rest of an islander child's life. Aristarchus was born in Samos close to the date of this eclipse. His birth date remains unknown. But we know that he grew up to become a mathematician, astronomer pondering celestial objects moves. In fact, no text of his have made it to this day. His work is known through other ancient and middle age mathematicians whose scripts made references to him. If Aristarchus saw the eclipse, he mustn't have forgotten it. Because in later years he witnessed another natural phenomenon where he noticed a detail that nobody else had before. The duration of solar and lunar eclipses were remarkably different. This had to mean something. A lunar eclipse occurs when Earth gets between the Sun and Moon. As the sun rays hit the Earth a shadow forms behind it. The shadow falling on the Moon obscures the rock. You have to know how planets move to understand this phenomenon. The Kumon belief in Aristarchus' lifetime was that Earth was stationary and the Sun, Moon and stars were orbiting it. It's hard to blame them. Because that was the truth seen from the world. You see celestial objects rising and setting in a circular path each day. Aristarchus saw a problem with this pattern and he had questions. How big could the sun and moon be? And how far? Like everyone else, Aristarchus thought that the sun and the moon seemed very similar in size. That's why the moon could completely cover the sun in a solar eclipse. Besides, if the moon could get in front of the sun it had to be closer to us. And the sun farther. But he just wasn't content with that. He had a plan to go further. He observed a lunar eclipse. He didn't have a watch but somehow followed the time from the first shadow of the moon until the last second of the eclipse. The moon stayed in the shadow for longer than a lunar eclipse. Unless the speed of the earth, moon and sun were unstable there had to be a single explanation. The earth had to be larger than the moon. A solar eclipse lasts 6 minutes tops whereas a lunar eclipse can take up to 2 hours. So, if the moon were as earth solar eclipses could last hours and could be seen from a larger portion of the world. Aristarchus' genius wasn't just about making a comparative estimation. He had thought of using dimensional proportions of these objects to calculate the moon's passage of time in the Earth's shadow. Thought invisible to us, Earth constantly casts shadow from the sun. Prior to the eclipse, the moon moves gradually towards this shadow. As the moon was fully covered the first time, it would have traveled as far as its own diameter in the shadow of the Earth. If this event took one unit of time, the total time would show how many moons could fit in Earth's shadow. According to Aristarchus' calculation, this ratio was 2, 85. Therefore, the Earth had to be 2, 85 times larger than the Moon. The exact figure we have right now is closer to 3, 5. Quite an impressive estimate for someone who didn't own a watch. Since the Earth's shadow doesn't have a sharp definition, Aristarchus had made a plausible mistake. But the path he had been on led to opening much different doors. This was the first scientific measurement of the celestial bodies. For the first time, someone had come up with a calculation as to how big our universe could be. Aristarchus' estimates didn't stop there. Upon seeing one full half of the moon illuminated he noticed a right triangle form between the sun, moon and earth. He calculated the ratio of the distance in between using the angles. During the same period, Eratosthenes, one of the greatest geographers had managed to precisely measure the Earth's diameter. When they brought these calculations together, they found out figures higher than anyone could have imagined so far. The Moon and Sun had to be tens of thousands of kilometers away from us. Moreover, the Earth was not at the center of the universe but the Sun was, and the Earth was revolving around it. Each of the other stars in the sky was other suns. 
they were just incredibly far away. Aristarchus was doing calculations and discovered something brand new. It was not the sun revolving around the earth. On the contrary the earth and other planets were orbiting the sun. So he suggested a sun-centered model. Even though the model was based on mathematical data it contradicted the belief of his day which is why his potentially revolutionary works got lost between the pages. Until Copernicus brought up this model once again and Galileo conflicted with the church. Aristarchus was left all alone on his little island. And in the whole world. His ideas were controversial for both the Greek and the Christian. Nobody followed his path for centuries. We only got to realize what possibly was Aristarchus' biggest dream 2200 years after his death. When the Saturn V rocket was launched the Sun was still orbiting Earth according to the Vatican. For thousands of years we had lived without knowing what deep space had. But finally there was a chance of going beyond our dreams. It took Apollo 11 12 minutes to reach the space and about 4 days to reach the Moon. 384,000 kilometers of distance covered at a speed of 4,000 kilometers per hour. The crew of Apollo 11 were the first people to have stepped on a piece of land outside the Earth. And the first people who have seen the spherical form of the Earth. The moon landing might be humanity's biggest success in history. It's a representation of farthest destination that a person have physically reached throughout the history. Nobody has managed to travel any farther since December 14, 1972. Though it seems like the barrier to humanity the moon is the closest celestial object to Earth. The universe has a completely different scale. Take the sun, it's 500 times farther away than the moon. That makes 150 million kilometers. The sun is so far that it takes 8 minutes for its rays to reach us. And we call this distance in between one astronomical unit. The distances are expressed by this unit in our system where kilometer calculations lose meaning. Our solar system contains the first celestial objects we have identified. The other planets of the system had been noticed centuries ago since they resembled stars but moved faster in the sky. Within the last half century we have visited each, though not personally. The closest planet to the Sun, Mercury. Following is the Earth's twin, Venus. Compared to us, Mars is one, five times farther from the Sun. So it's at a distance of one, five astronomical unit. The giant planet comes next, Jupiter. It's so large that all of the other planets in the solar system could easily fit inside it. It's quite far from the Sun. Five times as us. Then comes Saturn along with its ring. It's 10 astronomical units away from the Sun. It's the farthest planet visible to the naked eye. We had to wait until the invention of the telescope O discover at Lyde Eon Saturn. Uranus is around 20 units and Neptune around 30 units away from the Sun. Despite moving towards Neptune at times Pluto is approximately 40 astronomical units away. That makes 6 billion kilometers. The common perception was based on the Solat system ending with Pluto. But this system is larger than 40, 100 or even 1000 astronomical units. The range of the Sun X stands beyond 50,000 astronomical units forming the mass we call the Oort cloud. In this scale, Pluto is a tiny speck next to the Sun. Past Pluto is some billions of kilometers of space and over 10,000 dwarf planets like Pluto, and countless meteors. They are buried in the darkness of the space since they don't shine like the stars and are far from the Sun. The Sun appears like any ordinary star when observed from such planets. But the sunlight will travel there no matter how far. In one year's time a beam of sunlight can travel up to 63,000 astronomical units into the edges of our system. That is a distance of 9, 5 trillion kilometers. It is the next unit of measure that we have designed for the universe. One light year. You will need it to measure anything that is beyond our system. This need started to emerge around the 18th century. Upon finding solid proof on how and where the planets move the attention started shifting towards the stars. But measuring the distances between far objects is always a painful job. Estimating the distance of a star and a house on the horizon are equally difficult. They found the solution in an interesting method that had been used by sailors for centuries. Sailors knew little of the actual length of the ships they came across. They would hold out a thumb against the ship with one eye closed. When they switched eyes the finger's position on the ship would have slightly shifted. The size of the shift would be proportional to the ship's length. If the movement of the finger was 10 meters on the ship's scale the ship would be about 100 meters away. 
It's called the parallax method. The method became available only after many mathematicians led by Euclid and Archimedes discovered trigonometry. The finger's distance to the eye and the triangle they form together must be proportional to the larger triangle from the finger to the ship. The method had been around for ages. But you can't measure the movements of the stars in the sky by extending your thumb as if to measure a ship. Applying the same method on stars required a key discovery. And when it came, it achieved incredible success in astronomy. Consider Earth's position as a sailor's right eye. In six months the Earth will have crossed to the other side of the Sun 300 million kilometers away. Take this new location as the left eye. And the target star moves against the distant stars behind it, just like the shifting thumb. If you can measure the extent of the change you can calculate how far the star is from you. When 19th century astronomers started using this method it led to the first space race in history. Scientists from all over the world struggled to be the first to calculate the distance of a star. In 1838 Friedrich Bessel won the race and came first. This is the 61 Cygna star. It's 11, 4 light years away from us. Bessel had managed to measure the distance with a percent 10 error margin. Soon after the distance of the nearest star system was found out. Alpha Centauri. Its distance is nearly 4 light years. And the Vega star. 25 light years away from as. Applying the parallax method was not an easy task. It was like trying to measure the millimetric shift of a coin from 5 kilometers away. And that's the closest example. So, by the end of the 19th century the number of stars with measured distances had not exceeded 60. Technology has improved and enabled more sensitive measurements since. It has become possible to measure much more distant stars. The size of heavens seemed to be under 20-30,000 light years. Our universe was but a cluster of stars we called the Milky Way. Starting right above us, this strip crosses the horizon and wraps around the sky. All the stars we could see were within this cluster. That's what we thought for a long time. In 1925, Edwin Hubble took the first detailed photos of Andromeda using his Hooker telescope, the world's largest at the time. Hubble came across an image much more complex than a cloud. He examined the rays from the cloud and made a clear conclusion. Andromeda couldn't have belonged to our Milky Way. It was another star cluster far away consisting of billions of stars. The young scientist had made a discovery that would totally change the way we saw the universe. Hubble Space Telescope, which was sent to space with his name on, offers us the most detailed and beautiful images of Andromeda today. As well as further data on it. For thousands of years we'd only seen the Milky Way from inside and it looked a strip. But its actual form was the copy of Andromeda's. We had been looking at the universe through a plate-shaped spiral galaxy. We are the inhabitants of an island called to Milky Way on a sea called Space, about whose boundaries we have no idea. There are over 200 billion stars in our island some larger the Sun and some smaller. At the galaxy center sits a massive black hole, attracting everything. The stars in the arms turn around to avoid falling into the black hole. We're on one of the outer arms. We're over 25,000 light years away from the black hole. As if this wasn't big enough, the universe is full of billions of galaxies like the Milky Way. Some are bigger than the Milky Way, and some smaller. Some have spiral arms like ours while others are intertwined. There are way too many of them. But the distances between them are so great that even the scale of light year speed starts making no sense. In order to travel from some galaxy into others light has to travel for billions of light years. Hence the boundaries of the universe reach unfathomable magnitudes. But Edwin Hubble discovered more than the existence of these vast galaxies. In 1929, he proposed another groundbreaking idea regarding the limits of the universe. An idea that would be proved 45 years after his death. Hubble had seen that the galaxies he observed were almost the same size. In that case, the smaller ones should have been farther away. He followed their movements and speed to uncover something peculiar. Most of them were moving away from us. In fact, the farther the galaxies, the faster they moved away. This led him to think that the universe was not steady but expanding like an inflating balloon. Hubble was on the verge of another revolutionary discovery. In the 1900s, Einstein had one of the best comprehensions of the universe. According to his theory of general relativity the universe had remained stable since an infinite period of time. 
It was neither expanding nor shrinking. Einstein couldn't accept Hubble's idea of an expanding universe. For a long time he rejected the idea. But Hubble's discovery was so obvious that despite his unbelief Einstein visited Hubble's observatory. To see the edges of the universe with his own eyes. Now we use more advanced gadgets to check out the edges of the universe. Hubble, the most powerful space telescope we have can see as far as this galaxy that is 13, 39 billion light years away. 13, 8 billion light years was not long enough for any other beam of light from deeper in the universe to reach us. And since the universe continues to expand and accelerate we might never be able to see the end of the universe. If there really is such a thing. The ancient sailors never faced the end of the world like they feared. On his westbound venture in 1519, Captain Ferdinand Magellan's ship returned to its dark point and proved that the Earth was round. Maybe there is no walls or cliffs at the end of the universe. Even if we move keep moving in the same direction there might not be an end. And if you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to my channel for more videos like this one. Thanks again for watching.